We're very proud to present to you today the Ron Sang Collection. Lee Melville recently noted that this uh, reminded her of our very first auction in 2007 and that it's a, a combination of art and objects. And this has very much been Ron Sang's collecting philosophy for over 50 years. This is something of a survey of New Zealand practice with museum quality pieces by many of our leading artists and ceramicists. We've just had a wonderful viewing this past Sunday at the Sang family home. Ron and uh, his wife were very gracious in opening up their home so that we and collectors could see the works in situ and that really was a celebration of both Ron Sang the architect and Ron Sang the collector. We're currently on view uh, at our gallery at 3 Abbey Street in, in Newton of course. All the works in the catalogue will be going to auction this coming Thursday the 5th of March at 6.30pm. There's still time to come and see this wonderful exhibition. We look forward to seeing you uh, in the next couple of days and on the evening. It's been a fascinating process taking these paintings and pots which have existed for so long in the confines of Ron's home and bringing them into sort of the, the stark white walled environment of our gallery space. And a lot of the time they do definitely lose something. But once we've situated this magnificent Toss Wollaston painting on this wall to its own, it's just completely come to life I feel and uh, really looks absolutely magnificent. Now one thing that uh, this wonderful recent biography, this publication of Peter McLevy has done. It's sort of uh, reminded us of the history of some of these wonderful New Zealand art objects, and this is certainly one. Through the book we've learnt that McLevy showed this painting in 1971. He sold it to one of his sort of great clients at the time, an American I think by the name of John Cassily, who took the painting to America, it was there for many years, and it must have come back for the uh, Wollaston retrospective at the uh, Manawatu Art Gallery. And sometime thereafter it's uh, gone into the hands of Ron Sang, where it's been ever since. But uh, of course for those of you who read the book will know that uh, at the behest of McLevy in 1970, Wollaston up to scale to a remarkable level on these big 4 by 9 sheets of hardboard. And in doing so I think his painting really got a new lease of life for a while. This panoramic format ideally suited to the landscape of Wollaston's beloved Mapua and also to this wonderful vision of Tasman Bay with the mountains in the background. And I really feel this is one of the icons of New Zealand art history. Don Binney is an artist who of course is intensely associated with the west coast of Auckland and depictions of birds in the landscape. Here's a wonderful landscape that is effectively a bird's eye view of Bethel's Tahinga. This is the lake at Bethel's looking out to the coast. And it really is a tour de force of Binney's painterly skill. Here we see Binney responding to the varied landscape and vegetation of that wonderful, bold, striking west coast landscape with a wonderful array of painterly treatments from flowing brush strokes to almost sculptural three-dimensional paint application here through to the lovely grazed paint application that's so unique to Binney there representing the sea. Really a classic work from 1974. Here we have one of a very small number of works that Binney created of birds in other environments. Hawaii, of course, is another work in this catalogue. And here we have the Blue Mountains in Australia. This is Katumba Fatbird of 1982. And we can see that classic, gauzy, dusky blue for which the Blue Mountains are so named. And what we see here are some wonderful innovations. This is a bronzy gold paint to depict the sunlight catching the cliffs in the afternoon. And to my eyes, this work is really quite extraordinary for the controlled brilliance of Binney's brush strokes. This is a, a mature painter using brush, palette knife, and obviously other implements to get the wonderful three-dimensional sculptural quality of the feathers of the lovely plump fat bird within, for our eyes, to a certain extent, a slightly alien landscape, but of course recognisable as a classic Don Binney work. For me, this is another absolute icon of New Zealand art history. Centred around this tripartite family division here of the mother and the father and the baby, all brought together by this field of energy which Handy was working on for many, many years. 1983 this was painted on, so just right in and around the Golden Age period of paintings. And you can see the similar uh, nature between the Golden Age series and the Suburban Innocence series, this small series of works called Suburban Innocence, exhibited at Rodney Kirk Smith Gallery. The format is the same, but you know, give or take around 1200 millimetres square. But there's a resolution to this picture 
there's a collusion, I think, of, of the painterly, but also this hard resolved geometric order that makes this painting so incredibly successful. There's elements which we identify immediately with Hanley's painterly vocabulary. We have the peace dove here, this sort of triangular division over here, which maybe recalls Mount Eden or the suburban houses in and around Mount Eden where Hanley lived, but also some wonderful formal elements here. The fields of different paint, of different energy, of different colour, of different vitality, really combined to create what I think is uh, one of the nicest Hanleys I've ever seen. Ron Sang was as much a collector of art as he was of objects. There is a, an extensive collection of New Zealand studio pottery. Ron's first love, I think it's fair to say, was the work of Len Castle. Len Castle's pieces uh, predominate in this collection, ranging from pieces in the 70s, so quite early on in Len's career, right through to the sulphur bowls that were produced uh, toward the end of Len's life, up until 2011 or so. They had a very, very close friendship and collaboration right through Len's career, and in fact, Ron was the person to publish the really uh, vital volume on Len Castle's work, Len Castle Potter. Early in Len's career, uh, like a lot of New Zealand potters, Len was influenced by the Anglo-Oriental tradition of, of pottery, and we see it very clearly here in these Shino glazed platters. The Shino glaze actually originates in Japan, and I think in the late 16th or mid to late 16th century. And so Len here is drawing on that tradition, that sort of orange, milky, white sort of Shino glaze. This piece in particular really does emphasise the Japanese tradition with this what we call Ishihaze, a stone explosion. So moving into the later 1970s and early 1980s, um, we can still see the Anglo-Oriental influence over Lin's work. Particularly here what we've got is both Japanese and Chinese influences working. The form of these pots we have in front of us, we have the large blossom vase and the two bottle vases, is influenced by the Japanese master potters, in particular Shoji Hamada, who visited New Zealand in 1965. Then also we see here a Chinese influence in the glazes on these works. So we have this Jun glaze, and this is an absolutely splendid example. And then the other glaze that Len used very frequently, especially on these large blossom vases, that is this Timuka glaze. So as Len's career develops, he, he begins to move away from some of those traditions we've been speaking about, and he establishes a practice that I think is very, very reflective of the New Zealand landscape. And I think it is those pieces, more than the others, which are so enthusiastically collected now. Because they really do represent a break from traditional pottery forms, and they really do represent a celebration of the New Zealand landscape. Now, there are a number of pieces in the sale, but I'm just going to speak about the three pieces here, which really reflect that change in his practice. This superb alkaline crater bowl, obviously reflecting a crater lake with this lovely blue alkaline glaze. And then beside it, a similar form, but with this red lava glaze. So, of course, reflecting the geothermal landscape. And then we move to this uh, wonderful inverted volcano form. This is a really good example because we have this red lava glaze spilling over this jagged rim and down the surface. Obviously, it's an uncontrolled thing, and it comes down in this lovely drip down through the piece. Toward the end of his career, Len then went on to develop what have become also very, very distinctive and unique pieces for him. And these are these sulfurous bowls. And Len was working on these pieces right up until the conclusion of his his career and the end of his life in 2011. They really are absolutely superb with this sulfurous glaze bubbling away on the surface. But they're also on a very, very uh, thin, earthenware body. And I guess some facts also must be said here to Graham Ambrose, who worked with Len extensively toward the end of his career and worked with Len uh, on these sulfurous bottles. Also well represented in the collection is, is Graham Ambrose's work. There are a number of pieces. In front of me are two examples. This wonderful, what he calls, sun-glazed bowl and then this big, large red orb vase with this crackle red glaze. What we can say about Graham Ambrose is he works obviously in scale and also is a master of glazing. Graham Storm's work is, is well represented in, in Ron's collection. And there's a couple of examples in front of me here. It's the, the carved platter and this beautifully, beautifully carved vase, which kind of references scraffito cut work or Chinese su chao work as well. So very, very good example of, of Graham Storm's work. And just to round out the object section, those of you who had our wonderful viewing on Sunday at the Sang House would have seen uh, how this collection interplays uh, in Ron's life. Uh, and nothing's more true of that than the pieces that, that Ron chose for his garden. So all of these pieces come from Ron's garden, and these are splendid pieces of, of Roy Cowan's work, these big salt-glazed garden statues. The two pieces on my right and my left were both chosen to be exhibited uh, in a modest modernism at the Dallas last year. So 
So key pieces, I think, in, in Wickham's practice.